It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, yes, uh, Julie, I met while I was going door to door back in 1994, and uh, she didn't tell this little story, but uh, I went to the door, knocked on the door, uh, I didn't know who it was, but this lady came to the door, it was her mother, and, and I handed her my stuff, told her why, and I thought she should vote for me, and she said, well, you know, we're, we're thinking about it, she said, but my, my, my daughters are really for you, and I said, well, remember, Jesus said the little children will lead them, and and uh, so I started to walk off down the, the sidewalk, and I got out to the street, and all of a sudden, this voice says, we're for you, we're for you, and I, I went back and, and introduced myself. As it turned out, it was Julie's sister, Jeanette. I didn't, of course, know that at the time, but I said, remember, you know, uh, just follow your kids. They're obviously paying attention. So on election night, I won. I beat this 26-year incumbent by, you know, a whopping half of a percent of a vote, or 49 and a half to 51 and a half. That's 1% for your county measures. And, uh, and Julie came up afterwards and, and her sister and said, you probably won't remember who I am. And, and I didn't know their names, but I said, oh, yeah, of course I know. Y'all live on Pennywood Lane out in Collegedale. Just shocked her to death. And she thought, and they thought, I knew who they were. I just remembered the face and the street. And uh, I had to admit to her years later, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. But uh, anyway, they do, her parents still do live on Pennywood Lane. Now, in terms of the, what your requirements were, I just heard what you, you should do, and you have to write on something of substance. And probably I would suggest to you ahead of time, but don't all of you write the same thing, but uh, I think the thing of substance where this lecture tonight intersects with me is that I don't want to be a lawyer. And uh, that might be what you would want to put, and that would probably be sufficient, would it, Dean? To, would that be considered? Where, she's left. Oh, no, you're in the back. Okay, good, good. <laughs> So uh, anyway, th I, I didn't really know, I mean, I sort of did. I, I knew I was talking to business students. I, I knew my topic was supposed to be on the question of religious liberty. And, in, and what I want to suggest to you as you get ready to listen to this is that um, it's, it's, my comments are not um, practical nuts and bolts of things per se. Uh, what I've often found in my experience in politics is that we tend to be interested in just sort of the right answer. And we don't think about the implications of various answers, and we don't put various answers in a very broad context. And so, consequently, we, we begin to get far afield from where we should be and then wonder why we're so lost. And so this whole topic of religious liberty is uh, one that I have found in my experience we don't think very much about. And uh, Dean, this is not in my prepared remarks, but, uh, well, actually I won't read it at all, but I was going to read you an email. I wrote a, a commentary. I write one every Friday, so if you want to get on my good side, even though I'll never see you again, um, you could read my commentary every Friday. But um, I'd written a commentary some time ago about this question of religious liberty, and I had said what, what many people want to do is they want to, to ensure that their understanding of God and the relationship of God and whether there's a God and God's relationship to government is their view and exclude all other views about God and the relationship of God to government. So they, they really don't want religious liberty. They want their religious views to the exclusion of yours. And I said that is discrimination on the basis of religion. Well, this political liberal, I won't call their parties because I think both parties have their own political liberals in them in certain areas, but it is a politically liberal person who, who you would never identify with me, who wrote me and said, could we get together because you've made me think and you have a point of a view that needs to be understood by my community. So we've continued in a relationship for now about seven months. So, so that's sort of it, that if you're just wanting to know, well, can I do this when I'm at work? Can I put my Bible on my desk? Can I wear a cross? If I work in the school, is that one thing? If I work at Hazlett, Lewis, and Beter, is that another thing? Uh, if, if, if uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You can learn those rules. I want you to think more deeply than the rules. So I'm going to offer you a proposition. <coughs> tonight that religious liberty in our country hangs precipitously in the balance. And it does so because the foundation upon which it rests no longer 
even exists. Now that may seem shocking to some, particularly to uh, our non-student uh, participants here tonight, but I really don't believe we understand the, the foundation and history of religious liberty that led to its protection in the First Amendment. I mean, I hope all of you have heard that somewhere there is a constitutional right to religious liberty and free speech and freedom of press, and that's all in the First Amendment. But we don't understand the foundation, the scope of the history that led to that amendment, the limited scope of the protection under that amendment. And I hope to cover that this evening in order that we might be stirred to restore the foundation of religious liberty for future generations. Now for Christians, the foundation of any claim for liberty of any kind rests on the first chapter of Genesis. In fact, in the first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On that statement, along with others in the Bible that uh, explicate it, develop its implications, rest what theologians would call the transcendence of God. Now, I, I want to just ask, and don't feel free to not be embarrassed, or, or maybe you're just all really, really bright people. How many of you have heard of the word transcendence? Good. Y'all are above most people. In fact, the person who wanted to meet with me had never heard the word transcendence, didn't know what it was. But it's a concept, a theological concept, although it doesn't always have to be theological, that's given little thought anymore. Now in Christian theology, what it means is not what a lot of people think it means. It means that God is distinct from the creation and all that it contains. It means that God is over things, but not in a spatial sense. We tend to think of it spatially as God's up there. He's the, the big guy up there, so to speak. But theologically, it doesn't mean God is up there or He's far away or He's distantly f related from us in a spatial sense, but it has an ontological meaning, which goes to the essence of being. It's in essence what Paul said on Mars Hill when he's talking to the Epicureans and the Stoics of his day which I would submit to you are not going to be unlike the people you will run into in the business world and in our Mars Hill of our culture. And he said that it is in Him, God, that we live and move and have our being. Whether we appreciate it or not, none of us have in ourselves being. We're created. We're not infinite. God has being in Himself. Okay? And so, therefore, the implication of God's transcendence as the only source of being from which we get our being, and without Him we lose our being, is that we exist for Him. And therefore, we are subject to God. Now, disregard and even outright denial of that truth which is the predominant view in our culture anymore, everywhere has been the basis upon which liberty has been denied. For example, throughout much of ancient history, we find that cultures that believed there was a merger of sorts between God and the ruler, maybe actually believing the ruler to be God, like Pharaoh, or to be divinized in some way as the Caesars were, when that merger occurs, there's not much liberty, religious or otherwise. Because the one who holds the power of the sword has autonomous authority over everything. How do you say to God, no, when he holds the sword? He can feed you to the lions, put you to the stake. Now, in that sense, some might say there's really no difference between that pagan understanding of God as this autonomous, doing whatever I please because I'm God, and the God of Scripture. The God revealed in Scripture is one that we say is always free, meaning he's never forced or influenced by considerations outside of himself. 
He doesn't look and say, oh my goodness, Donald Trump is president. I can't get anything done I want to do. I won't be able to do this. Or if Obama is president, how am I ever going to do this? God's actions are always in himself and they're always free. They're never forced. He doesn't care what you and I do in that sense as if he's going to wring his hands. He's supreme in every regard and he's sovereign in the execution of his purposes. It's the story of Nebuchadnezzar who stood on his balcony and said, Look what I've done by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. And the scripture tells us that while the word was in his mouth, God said to him, as you might say, Shut up. What? You dumb ox. Who do you think you are? I'm the source of all power and it is for my glory and I think I'll just have you wander around like some dumb animal in the field until you recognize that. And so he did. And he says he looked up to heaven and his reason returned to him and he said, oh, there's a God that's not me. You see, that's the Christian understanding of God that his hand cannot be turned back. He cannot be thwarted as Nebuchadnezzar confessed. And who can turn back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, the thing that we also have to understand, however, is that unlike Pharaoh or the Caesars, the Christian beliefs, the thoughts and actions of God revealed in Scripture, that uh, he's different. Because all of his actions flow from the perfection of those divine attributes that constitute his being. He doesn't say, I love people. He says, I am love. When we love, that love that we express, its being originates in God. Therefore, we have the ability as image bearers to love. And all of God's actions are always working in perfect harmony with one another. So God is never just... So i got to kind of ease off on the love thing over here. Or I'm all love, so I'll never be just. All of his divine attributes work in harmony together always. So that tempers this, any thought that the God of Scripture is just some ogre. Which is the reason some people reject the thought of God, but they misunderstand the character of God. But the other thing we have to appreciate is that the foundation for the Christian belief in the limited sovereignty of government is is rested not just in the transcendence of God. That in other words, he's the one that has authority and all authority and all power on earth is a delegated authority subject to God. But the Christian doctrine is of the Trinity. You've probably heard of the Trinity, but the, the concept of the Trinity is that Jesus bore two natures, a human nature and the divine nature. And at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, the Christians got together in a context not unlike today where pagan rulers were thinking they were God and said, no, 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 the whole idea of the Trinity is man cannot be divinized, he cannot be God because in Christ those two natures never commingled, never compounded. And so we can say to Caesar, you have an authority but it is not a divine authority. And you therefore can be resisted because you can act outside of and contrary to the divine sovereignty that's over yours and through which yours comes. But my point here is that there was no real liberty, religious or otherwise, in ancient civilizations when there was no transcendent God or where transcendence was transferred to something in the created order like the ruler or the king. So even though the Edict of Milan by Constantine, which said Christianity would be allowed, did uh, bring an end to the prosecution of the uh, Christians, eventually God became identified with the ruler again. We tend to want to do that. So for example, you have the Holy Roman Empire where Charles II and others thought that they were the expression of God in the world. And it was actually against that understanding of civil government that had become divinized as representing the transcendent God on earth 
that in the 12th century, in the mid-1100s, Hildebrand, known as Pope Gregory VII, began to assert the church's independence from the civil ruler. Now, what most of you are going to hear is the church always tried to dictate to the civil ruler. For most of the history of the world, it was exactly the opposite. And particularly in the, in the ancient civilizations with which we're most familiar. It was the investiture struggle in the 1150s to 1175 by the Pope that said, hey, we ought to decide our own bishops and our own stuff and not be under the thumb of the government. So the next time somebody tells you that, you need to set them straight. Now, again, I just said that eventually the Pope did begin to assert that he had certain authorities over, okay? But that then provides the context for the First Amendment. The tension here between an ecclesiastical organization representing the church and another hierarchical organization representing the state or the king or the, the monarch or whatever it might be. That was the tension. There was never any understanding that somehow God had to be kept cordoned off from religion because that was impossible. The question was, which hierarchy was going to represent God and do God's will on the earth? You see the difference. So, that's the story of the history that led to the First Amendment. So, in keeping with the idea of fake news, which seems to be in the paper a lot, the next time you hear that the, um, that the, the First Amendment and the whole struggle was over trying to keep thoughts about God or religiously informed views related to public policy and ethical matters. That's what the First Amendment was to do. The answer is, uh-uh. That was not the purpose. As I've said to some of my atheist friends and this friend of mine, I said, every view in the world is necessarily predicated on some understanding about God. And even the belief there is no God is definitely a view about God. And don't you find it ironic that we have such militant atheists who are mad at the thing they say doesn't exist? If you got back to your, mo your, your, your dorm room or home tonight and said, I'm really mad at ego or Iga or something over here, and they start asking you who it is, and you say, well, he doesn't exist, but I'm really furious. They might get the people down at Moccasin Bend to come by with a little white coat with long sleeves that tie in the back. So we've got a whole culture out here that does have to deal with God because God will not allow us to ignore him. So believe he doesn't exist, but that's a view about the nature of God. Well, I believe God does exist, but he has no relationship to civil government. Well, that's a view about God and the relationship to civil government. That's a religious view. I happen to think that the authority of government comes from God. That's a religious view. Why does your view get to go in the Constitution and mine can't? Why does the First Amendment exclude my establishment but not your establishment? You get it? So when you run into some of these folks, you don't have to get mad. Just ask them to start answering some, some basic questions. So what do you think about God? Well, I don't think there is a God. Well, is that a religious perspective? Well, I guess it would be. Okay, so you want that one in the Constitution, right? I thought you just said we should keep all views about God out of the Constitution. That's a view about God, isn't it? Hmm, I'll have to think more about that one. Thank you very much. Don't let people do stupid. I shouldn't say stupid, should I? Don't let people think foolishly around you. And don't you dare get caught thinking foolishly, because someday you'll run into me, and I'll catch you. And I'll say, I remember you at the lecture. You were from Chicago. You were from Chicago. Yeah, that's right. I'll remember you. I remember Pennywood Lane 25 years later. So anyway, I'm getting off story. I told you, Dean, I would do that. But So anyway, that's the point, the First Amendment. Now, let's, let's just look at a little bit of history, because I'm going to share with you some history that you probably don't know. The First Amendment's purpose was clearly and succinctly stated by one of the earliest and brightest Supreme Court justices, Joseph Story. Most people don't know about Joseph Story. 
but uh, he was uh, the Dane Professor of Law at Harvard University. He was the youngest person ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. He was the right-hand man to Chief Justice John Marshall, often wrote many of his opinions that Marshall signed, and he wrote the first commentary on the Constitution that was published in 1833. He was nine years old when the Constitution was adopted. So this is a guy that's sort of contemporaneous in time. He's teaching law at Harvard. He's on the United States Supreme Court. He is the guy that wrote the first commentary, and here is what he said. The real object of the First Amendment was not to countenance, much less to advance Mohammedism or Judaism or infidelity by prostrating Christianity, but to exclude all rivalry among Christian sects and to prevent any national ecclesiastical establishment. Reference there that he says the First Amendment. He doesn't say the Free Exercise Clause. You notice that? The object of the First Amendment was to prevent a national ecclesiastical establishment. Now why would he refer to the whole of the First Amendment as having that singular purpose? Because the Free Exercise Clause and the prohibition on religious tests were to be understood in furtherance of the Establishment Clause, not as some distinct separate right that I got this one and I got this one and they're juxtaposed against each other. And here's what he says. It was impossible that there should not arise perpetual strife, perpetual jealousy on the subject of what? People having religious views? No. Ecclesiastical ascendancy. The Pope rises up, or the, the Presbyterians, or the Congregationalists, or the Episcopalians are in charge of the government. If, he says, the national government were left free to create a religious establishment. In other words, it was going to be impossible to keep, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists want to come over here and they're wanting everybody to give the, the federal government the patronage to the Seventh-day Adventists, but then you got the president, the Presbyterians, and they're wanting it, and you got the Episcopalians, and they're wanting it. He said it would have been possible, the only security, oh, excuse me, I need to flip my side. The only security was in extirpating the power, which is what the Establishment Clause did. It said you cannot establish a religion. So, so we extirpated the power. But this alone, if that's all they'd had was the first part of the First Amendment, would have been an imperfect security had it not been followed up with <coughs> by a declaration of the right of the free exercise of religion and the prohibition of all religious tests. In other words, religious liberty was intended to prevent an establishment of religion. So that, for example, as I've mentioned, the Congregationalists, the Episcopalians, who were prominent in that day, could claim the patronage of the federal government. Now, as a check on my interpretation of that, in case you're saying, well, I, I kind of don't believe that, that's not going to be right. There's another letter from Thomas Jefferson. You have heard of Thomas Jefferson, I assume, who wrote to Benjamin Rush. And it was a few months prior to Jefferson's election. And it's in reference to, quote, certain sects that opposed his election. And here's what he wrote. Nobody pays attention to this letter, because you like the letter you like and you hate the letter you don't like, right? The clause of the Constitution which covered the freedom of religion, that's the free exercise clause, had given to the clergy a very favorite hope of obtaining an establishment of a particular form of Christianity through the United States. So I've got the freedom to practice my religion, so I'll use my freedom to practice my religion to, to, to say, well, I get to practice my religion, which means I can now get the government to do what I want them to do. He said, especially, notice this, the Episcopalians and the Congregationalists. We're going to come back. I highlighted the word Congregationalists. He said, they believe that any portion of the power confided to me will be exerted in opposition to their schemes, and they believe truly. Not going to let those old Congregationalists and Episcopalians use their liberty to wind up backdooring the Establishment Clause and establishing themselves as the ecclesiastical hierarchy somehow in charge of the, the federal government like the Pope used to do, 
or getting the patronage and the money from the federal government. Okay? So that's why the Danbury Baptist Association wrote to Thomas Jefferson. They were from Connecticut. And guess who the official state church was in Connecticut? Congregationalists. Now you understand why they wrote. They said, we're so glad you won, Mr. Jefferson, because we live in a state where privileges are granted to us by the established church. And some of them are degrading, if you read their whole letter, that what we have to do is free men to, to get our religious liberty. And I hope you're going to keep up with your campaign promises and not let religious liberty be twisted into some kind of establishment of religion. And so he says, no, I will keep a wall of separation. So what the Supreme Court of the United States did, for all your friends who like the fake news, is the Supreme Court took one letter of Jefferson out of the context of the whole dispute over the church in the state and the divinization of government and, and or church and which would be in charge, not whether religious views could inform my views of abortion or marriage or any of that stuff. And Jefferson was saying, yeah, I'm going to honor the Establishment Clause. So don't worry about it. I'm not going to let those creepy Episcopalians and Congregationalists wind up taking over the federal government and, and, and requiring patronage and not letting you do your thing on your day and whatever else, okay? That's a little bit different, isn't it, from what you've probably heard. So that's what's created our current mess with respect to the Constitution. Now, if you took the sentence that I gave you where, at the beginning, Story had said the the object of the First Amendment, and you elid the Mohammedans and the, Judea, the, the Jews, and you take Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and the reference for ended fidelity was unbelief, that's what it meant at the time, disbelief in the, I'm quoting here from, from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, disbelief of the inspiration of the Scriptures, the divine original of Christianity, <coughs> what Joseph Story said was, quote, the real object of the First Amendment was not to countenance much less to advance atheism by prostrating Christianity. That's exactly what we now do. We say, Governor Lee, you can't even have a private worship service before your inauguration, before you even become governor, paid for by private funds because the Freedom From Religion Foundation thinks that violates the Establishment Clause. Huh? Huh? So once I become governor, I can't invite anybody to come to church with me. Hello? Where did my religious liberty go? So what we do is we now prostrate Christianity to advance atheism, which is exactly the opposite of what Joseph Story said. Now, let me read you this little fine quote, again from his commentaries. Probably at the time of the adoption of the Constitution of the amendment to it, now under consideration, the First Amendment, the general, if not universal, sentiment in America was that Christianity ought to receive encouragement from the state, so far as it wasn't incompatible with the private rights, private rights, not public rights, of conscience, and the freedom of religious worship. An attempt to level all religions and to make it a matter of state policy to hold all in utter indifference would have created universal disapprobation, if not indignation. Now, I would submit, of course, it would, would create disapprobation because you can't be indifferent to religion. As I explained at the beginning. Now, given that historical backdrop, one of the earliest religious cases in which the free exercise clause came up was Reynolds versus United States. In that case, the United States Supreme Court had to decide whether the free exercise clause prohibited a Mormon in the territory of Utah from being prosecuted for violating the federal government's territorial law criminalizing polygamy. So the territories were under federal law, said polygamy is out banned. Mr. Reynolds, a Mormon, says, well, my religion you know, allows, authorizes, approves, condones, encourages polygamy, and you're violating the, my free exercise clause. And here's what the court said. Laws are made for the government of actions. And while they cannot interfere with mere religious beliefs and opinions, they may with practices. So here, as a law of the organization of society under the domain of the United States, it provided that plural marriages shall not be allowed. 
Can a man excuse his practices to the contrary because of his religious belief? To permit this would be to make the professed doctrines of religious belief superior to the law of the land. And in effect, to permit every citizen to become a law unto himself. Government could exist only in name in such circumstances. Hey, I got a right to smoke peyote, you know. I'm an American Indian. Oh, you don't? There's a law against smoking drugs. Yeah, but my religion requires it. Well, mine likes LSD. Mine likes ecstasy. Mine likes having sex with little girls. Mine likes having sex with little boys. Mine likes, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you can come up with all kinds of religions. If you've ever been to, to California, and I think it's Muscle Beach, you'll see them all lined up. They all have booths. You can find anything you want over there. <coughs> now, okay, I'm going to keep moving on here because I only have another, what, another hour and a half, I think you said, so, so I want to get this done. So anyway, so the free exercise clause doesn't allow a citizen to do anything that his religion would enjoin on him or prohibit him from doing because that would make everybody a law unto themselves. Now, this is what's interesting. Till the 1960s, the high court, they did swerve in this area by holding in a case called sherbet. It's like ice cream sherbet, I mean, uh, you know, rainbow sherbet, but it's sherbet, not sherbet. My wife corrects me all the time. Versus Werner. Now, that case actually involved a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, if that's the president, tell him I'm unavailable. That laws infringing on religious belief and practices without a compelling reason and not narrowly tailored to achieve that reason were unconstitutional. It's called strict scrutiny. So, so what had happened in that case, the guy said, well, I have to worship on Saturday. And, it, and, and so he got fired. And he said, well, that was not good cause. And, and so it went to the Supreme Court. And they said, that law, there's no compelling reason for us to make a guy have to work on Saturday or Sunday or some other thing, unless there's a really compelling government reason and there's no other way to get around it, and so they applied that sort of standard, okay? But 1990, in the case of Employment Division versus Smith, the court said Sherbert was limited to unemployment compensation claims and reaffirmed the principle in Reynolds from 100 years earlier that the right of free exercise doesn't relieve a person the obligation to comply with a, quote, valid and neutral law of general applicability because it violates his religious beliefs. So if a law is, is general in its uh, applicability, then I don't care what your religious belief is, you're out of luck. Okay? Now, if they said something specifically like you, uh, you, 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 you can't or you, you can wear a hat into the courtroom unless you're Jewish and you're Orthodox and you want, then you can't do that. Well, now that targeted your religion. But if it's just a general law that says, look, you can't wear a hat in the, in the courthouse for security reasons because you might have a bomb under it, don't come in here and tell me that you're an Orthodox Jew and you got, or whatever they, I think it's Orthodox, and you got to wear your yarmulke. Don't, don't do that. Don't tell me some nun, you got to wear your habit. Take your thing off. Okay? We see a lot of that going on right now with Muslims. You know, I have to wear the thing that covers my face for my driver's license. No, you don't have any right to do that. That's a law of general applicability. It's not targeting Muslims. What if you're a cowboy and you want to wear your thing over your face. You can't do that. You can't do that. So, okay, well, we, I'm getting off. But anyway, <clears throat> so you need to know that as long as the law is neutral on its face, if general applicability doesn't seem to be targeting somebody in specific, then you're okay. In fact, the state Supreme Court just a few years ago overturned a law in Tennessee that was designed to exempt Christian scientists from criminal laws about not providing treatment to your children because they don't believe in certain kinds of treatment. And they said, well, now you're targeting, a sp you're in essence targeting all religions for the sake of this one religion. So if I'm Baptist or Seventh-day Adventist and I think I should do something for my child, I go to jail, but not the Christian scientists. The court said, no, that's a, that's a problem. You can't do that. That was targeting 
although it appeared to be neutral, the way it was worded, it would be as if somebody passed a statute and said everybody has to do something. Unless, unless your church was created by Joseph Smith in Utah by direct revelation from God and blah, 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 blah. And then you'd say, gosh, I wonder how many religions are like that. I think just Mormons. Okay, so that would get you in trouble without saying Mormons, okay? So the courts aren't stupid, although at times they are. But um, so that's what I'm talking about, targeting. Now, let's go to the cake baker case. Have any of y'all read the cake baker case? Came out last year. That was not a victory for religious liberty. Now, you probably heard that, but it wasn't. Mr. Phillips' lawyer's primary argument was freedom of speech. Why? Because the law said you had to serve everybody regardless of their religion, their ethnicity, um, their, their race, religion, sexual orientation. That's a general law of general applicability. It didn't say... You know, you have to serve everybody unless you're a Christian, or you don't have to, you do have to serve everybody unless you're a Christian. It was just a general law. Mr. Phillips was sunk. So the Supreme Court had said in the employment case, if it's a neutral law, you're out of luck. But now, if the law is neutral, but it's related to another constitutional right, such as freedom of speech, then we'll hear your case. Because now there's something else implicated. So that's why Mr. Phillips was arguing when you walk into a certain room and you see a certain multi-layer thing that tends to be white with uh, two people on the top, you don't walk in and say, wow, whose birthday is it? Who got a promotion at work? You say, that's a wedding. And he said, look, I'm designing a cake that everybody that walks in the room knows that's a wedding. And I'm communicating that a wedding has taken place by my artistic design. That is an expression of mine that I cannot make any more than somebody wanted me to write something on the cake that I didn't like. Okay. Now, just before you say that's stupid, Mr. Fowler, because I have some people that say, well, that's stupid. Let me ask you, when you go in the bathroom and you see something on the left on the nozzle that's, that's, that's uh, uh, red and something on the right that's blue, do you stop to read, does that say hot or cold? It's called semiotics. It is a field of study which says that we often communicate by symbols. We do it all the time. I bet you if they didn't write mail on the bathroom door, there's probably something up there that looks sort of like a stick with different from the one that looks like a person with a dress, right? So that's what he's saying. This, this cake communicates something that I can't communicate. So it was a speech case, not a religious case. Now you say, oh yeah, but Hobby Lobby, remember they won, Mr. Fowl. That was a religious liberty. They said that the, the Catholic people didn't have to provide abortifacients through, through their group, fam, uh, group health insurance policy at Hobby Lobby because they're strong Catholic people. Well, that was a religious liberty case. But they did not win because of the First Amendment. They won because of a federal statute called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act that Congress passed after the Supreme Court articulated the employment division case and said, as long as it's a neutral law, you're out of luck. So Congress said, well, we like the old Sherbert test. We're going to put it in statute. So Hobby Lobby got to go in and say, see that statute? See that federal law? They're making me provide an abortifacient when there is no compelling reason why I as a Catholic should have to do that, and there aren't other ways the government can't get abortifacients to people. And so the Supreme Court said, you're right. Laws not... The law violates the statute, not the First Amendment. So there was talk immediately after Hobby Lobby by those who did not like that decision, who were pro-abortion, to repeal that statute. Do you realize had that statute been repealed, Hobby Lobby would have been out of luck? Then you say, well, great, Mr. Fowler, but how does that help me at the state? What happens is the state of Tennessee makes me provide an abortifacient or makes me do something else. Well... One of the things our organizations did as soon as I got out of the legislature and could start lobbying people was uh, we passed, in essence, well, we passed a Religious Freedom Protection Act in the state of Tennessee so that if the state or a local government begins to infringe on your religious practices, like in the Seventh-day Adventist Church saying, well, everybody's got to stay open on Saturdays. If you run a business, you've got to be open on Saturdays. Well, there'll be some Seventh-day Adventists say, I can't do that. Well, 
You know, if you're open to the public, there you go, you got to do it. They could come in under the Tennessee law and say, well, there, tell me what the compelling reason is for that and why you have to make me close down. Is there just nowhere else anybody can buy a Little Debbie? Are there no red food stores or food kings or food lines or anything else anymore? You got to keep the, the Little Debbie outlet store open here, run by a seventh day. No, 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 no. So they strike it down. But if that statute's ever repealed, you're out of luck. Now I'm going to get to the scary part. Whoa, I'm running out of time, but we'll, we'll have time. I'm, 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 I'm an hour behind y'all, so I can stay you know, real late. It's fine with me. So here's what you need to appreciate. 1938, in a case that all law students study, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Big, big, big important case. Every lawyer, law student reads it. The United States reconsidered a proposition involving common law claims when two citizens from different states sued each other. Now, this is a little bit, uh, have any of y'all had a, any kind of class on any of this stuff about diversity and uh, federal courts or, you know, I don't know. But anyway, you, you can't just say, well, I, I want a federal judge to decide this rather than, uh, you know, the guy down there in the state court because he probably graduated from UT law school and I want the Harvard guy, you know, you can't do that. You can only go into the federal court under the Constitution, if there's a federal question involved, what does the statute, federal statute require, or what does the Constitution require? You can't run in there and say, well, what does this state law require? Can't do that. But you can, if citizens are from different states, go in to federal court. And the idea was, we don't want Fowler dragging some poor guy from Kentucky down here into the Hamilton County Court where everybody's going to say, Fowler gives lots of money to political candidates and he knows everybody and I'm a judge and I'm running for office and so you Kentucky guy you lose I don't care what the facts or the law is you know so so they put them in federal courts if you have a certain amount of money that's involved you can't just go in there like Judge Wapner stuff okay or Judge Judy you, you got to have enough money diversity of citizenship so what happens is there's a common law have you all heard how many of you have heard the common law if you hadn't heard of it okay gosh y'all are a great university the common law there's lots of things that are common law the right to contract okay like I could agree to, to, to buy, um, you know, your satchel here and give you 50 bucks and I'll say, now I'm going to come by on Friday. We just signed a contract. You took my 50 bucks. You don't give me that thing on Friday when I come by, I sue you. No statute that gives me a right to do that. It's just everybody knows people do that. They've been doing it since Abraham got land to bury Sarah on, you know. So, so common law case. The question was then, so... So now i got people from Kentucky, and the common law of Kentucky says this, and the common law of Tennessee says this. What do I do? The federal court said, well, we'll decide what the common law is. I don't care what Kentucky said or Tennessee said. And the reason they said that is because they believed in this concept of transcendental law. Now, that's not meditation. That's transcendence, like we were talking about. Okay? And they said, here's the deal with transcendent law, is that it exists over all these jurisdictions. The common law of contracts isn't unique to Tennessee or Kentucky. It just is. We've known that it is, okay, forever. And so what would happen is the judge would have one of these, these cases involving diversity, and the judge would look up into the transcendent sky and say, okay, David gave her $50. She admits she said he would give, she would give him the bag, and she didn't give him the bag. That's wrong. He needs his money back, or she needs to give the bag. But the judge would then take the law and bring the law down to earth, so to speak, and apply it. Now here's what the court said, and this was, this was the fundamental case in 1842. In the ordinary use of language, now this is fascinating to me, it will hardly be contended that the decisions of courts constitutes laws. I mean, nobody argues that that's the law when I say, you give him the bag or give him his $50 back. They are at most only evidence of what the law are, laws are not themselves the laws. In other words, this, this goes back to this sort of concept of Plato, that there's this ideal thing up here, and we try to understand it. And so when I issue a decision, I'm saying, I think this is what the law is, but I could be mistaken. I could get it wrong. I could have misunderstood that principle. And so 10 years later, I've got a similar case, and I say, man, I wasn't thinking smart on that. This is what should happen, okay? But the concept was, the judge, have you ever heard the expression, judges don't make laws? There it is. 
the law is some transcendent thing that God has imposed on everybody that we're all subject to. We do our best to understand it and then apply it in this situation with David and the student on the front row. But we may be mistaken. But the law is not mistaken because that's God's. Now, after Darwin, 1859, the thought of evolution began to enter into our law schools. And a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes said, there is no transcendent law. And here's what the court said, 1938 in Erie Railroad. The fallacy underlying the rule in Swift v. Tyson, which I just quoted you, is made clear by Justice Holmes, our good evolutionary atheist friend. The doctrine rests on the assumption there's a transcendental body of law outside of any particular state, but obligatory in it, unless and until changed by the legislature. So everybody in the whole state, it's common to everybody, you give her $50, she says she'll give you the pocketbook on Friday, she ought to do it. Okay? He said, there isn't any body of law out there that says that. Law in which the sense the courts speak of it today doesn't exist without some definite authority behind it. Well, the Christian would say, well, there is a definite authority. It's the transcendent God who created all things. Now, we might be mistaken as to what the law is from time to time, but, but it has an authority behind it. And they said, no, 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 we can't believe that anymore because there's not any God. Evolution has proved there's no God. There can't be a source of transcendent law. The authority and only authority is the state. Now, I'll admit the Christian lawyers weren't paying attention when that decision came out and the Christians weren't paying attention because they should have objected like crazy because you see what we've done is we've divinized the state again the only authority that exists now is the civil ruler and then in 2015 in the case of Obergefell v. Hodges the Supreme Court address the question of marriage. And here's what they said, and to me it was very fascinating. I would submit to you, and I know your generation, my generation, and the generation of some of these folks, because they're all way much older than I am. I'm only 60. <coughs> um, and I'm sure none of y'all are 60 yet either, but um, we, we would have said, you know, mar no, marriage is by definition man and woman. You can have another relationship, and it's great, and it's fine, and it may be wonderful, it may be good. It's just not a marriage. But the court said, no, 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 marriage has nothing to do with the complementariness of the two biological sexes. And in the course of that ruling, here's what they said. So, so, so I'm more interested in how they got to that conclusion. Okay. You're either telling me i got ten minutes, or you're saying, whoa, stop. So I'm going to take the ten-minute option of, in, of sign language interpretation. Same-sex couples, too, may aspire, notice what they said, to the transcendent purposes of marriage and seek fulfillment in its highest meaning. Oh, that sounds so nice, and it's so stupid. <laughs> Why is it stupid? They just said there's no transcendence. What they have done, I would submit to you who know your Bible, is they've done exactly what Paul said in in Romans chapter 1, that they exchange the truth of God for a lie. We do it all the time. We can't escape God. Even the atheist can't escape God. He's angry at him. But we'll say, I know there's got to be a concept of transcendence because there's got to be some basis for meaning. Otherwise, it's meaningless. So there's got to be transcendence. But guess where it is now? rooted in the creation not just the creation it's rooted in a majority of five judges on the United States Supreme Court the foundation for liberty and religious liberty as a subset for it is now gone you have no right to claim that there is some self-evident right endowed by my creator <laughs> doesn't exist Don't come running in here, Fowler, and tell me you got some right to religious liberty. 
You only have what the government said, and the government said you don't have it. Now, I know y'all are young people, but what got me into politics was having a six-year-old little daughter who I looked at and I said, I see where we're headed. And I don't want her to look at her daddy someday and say, Dad, what did you do to preserve to me any rights against the government that I might be a free person? And I said, well, I was afraid somebody would get mad at me. I was afraid I might lose my job. I might have to go work at Walmart as the greeter because I can't use my nice CPA degree from Southern University. And she'd say, well, thanks, Dad, for what you gave me. Live in slavery to the youth. So I decided to run against the 26-year incumbent and say, I'll see if I can do better. So think whatever you want to think about Obergefell and gay marriage, but understand what the court's done to you, done to your children and your grandchildren, done to you when you say, I have a right to something. You have no rights, but such as the Supreme Court says you have. Or Congress or the legislature gives you in a statute that tomorrow they repeal. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? But make sure when you answer the question, you're either going to have the liberty that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden, which was to enjoy it all but one thing. Remember, I'm God. Or you're going to have the tyranny of man who acts like God. Those are your two choices. What are you going to do about it? So with that, I'll answer questions for another seven minutes, right? And Dean, I hope I haven't gotten you fired. But if I have, you can come work for my organization, which extending you that offer might get you fired too. But anyway, uh, what, what questions do you all have other than you're sure now you don't want to be a lawyer? Hey. Ask me anything. Trust me, I've been asked hard questions on CNN before. By, what's his name? Who's the white-haired guy on CNN? Uh, yeah, Anderson Cooper. Yeah, so y'all aren't going to get me in trouble, so go ahead. Ask me something hard. Surely you've got to have something hard. Yes. Let him go. Was, uh, I'm not messing you up. The only justification for it was uh, that it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a compelling reason, so he only got. Yeah, what the, what the Supreme Court like said, them, well, what, what the court said in the employment context, he had gotten fired, okay? And let, let me just read it to you because I didn't read it. See, I got carried away. But here's what the, the Supreme Court actually said. They said in that case, that the right of free exercise uh, was limited, oh, I put it in here, I think it was, because when you get to employment claims, the question is good cause. Did you fire somebody for good cause? So that invites sort of a subjective analysis, okay, for you to say, well, what was the reason here? Well, because I have to worship on Saturday, and they wouldn't let me. And they said, well, you've got to have a compelling reason to do that. Isn't there some, couldn't he work on Sunday? Couldn't he work longer hours on Friday? You, you don't have a reason to to force him to do that, okay? And what they did is the Supreme Court in Employment Division versus Smith in 1990, so that was a 1960 case, they said that's limited to workers' comp claims because the law itself invites this question of what's good cause and not what's good cause. But if the law is just neutral on its face and said everybody's got to, if you own a business, you have to be open to the public seven days a week you have to be open 40 hours a week, and some of those hours must be on every day of the week. That law would be neutral on its face. So you say, I would like to do my 40 hours Monday through Friday and on Sunday. No, 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 no. If you want to do business in the state of Tennessee, you want to do business under the federal government, you're a certain size, you're McKee Bakery. Of course, they bake. They don't operate retail. But see, that's, that's what they did to the cake baker. They said, anybody walks in the door, you have to give them a cake. And he said, well, I, I can't because that cake expresses something I can't communicate. So the Seventh-day Adventist, <coughs> I would say at this point, only has the protection of the statute. No constitutional protection. 
So you got to keep, don't run out here and say, we had this wacky guy said that the federal government can require me to do anything. No, the federal government's passed a statute that would protect you. And so we do also have in the workplace, if you read my, my, my speech, which will be better and won't be as ad lib, but you'll see footnotes and you'll see we have Title VII, which is the Workplace Employment Act, federal law. Okay, so, so you would have those protections. All I'm trying to tell you is that religious liberty now depends upon a statutory enactment of the state or the federal government. And if that statute is modified or repealed and you want to say, yeah, but I still have the First Amendment, I say to you, you're out of luck. Because as long as the law is neutral on its face, you got to do it. The law prohibiting polygamy didn't say, now the ban on polygamy only applies to, to Mormons. No, it applied to the closet Baptist, you know, who wanted to have a girlfriend in the other port, okay? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pick on Baptists. I grew up one, so. But you see what I'm saying? The law was neutral. It didn't care what religious faith you were. But it impacted Mormons. And he said, well, I've got the right to do this. And he said, no, you don't. That makes you a law unto yourself. Do you see what I'm talking about? So really, the Supreme Court has rejected the Declaration of Independence. There are no rights in die by a creator because there is no transcendent source for them. The only law that exists is the law of the state. So when you want to argue, but, 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 I say to you, no buts. I got enough votes, I do it. Got a lot. That's scary. Scare you? Scare me. Now, let me tell you how this is going to work out, my friends. I'll just give you a little example of where Obergefell goes. A lot of people, even Christians, say, I don't care about something. You know, Bob and Fred are married down the street. What do I care? I'll just give you an example of how you're going to care, or you may care. Some of you may want to have children someday. I hope. Okay? The Supreme Court has said you have to treat same-sex relationships and heterosexual relationships, and we're going to call them both marriages, even though they're not the same thing, okay? They're, they're different kinds of relationships. Relationships defined without regard to the complementariness of relationships is not the same kind of thing as this. They can both be relationships, but they're not the same kind. One defined without it and one defined with it. They say, well, you got to treat all these equally. Now, here's the problem. Susie and Sally get married. Okay, I have to let them get married. David and Linda get married. David and Linda have a child. The state doesn't like something David and Linda's doing, and they say, we're going to take this child away from you. And I say, no, no, wait a minute. I'm a parent. I have certain God-given rights as a parent relative to the nature of my child. If I'm not committing a crime, you, you kind of need to leave me alone here. If I want to teach them there's a heaven and a hell, or I want to make them go to church, or I want to send them to that school where Karen Pence is going to teach art that doesn't believe in this stuff, this, all the sexual liberation stuff, I got a right to have my child go to that school. Now, here we got Susie and Sally, and they went to the donor bank, and Daddy is number 87. Now, how can both of those people in that marriage have the same kind of relationship to their child as me and my wife? No way. Because one of them is not, nor never will be, biologically related to that child. They cannot claim any pre-existing, pre-governmental right to be a parent. So what will the court have to do? They'll have to say, David and Linda, your rights have to only come from the government too, because otherwise you won't be equal. And that's exactly what happens. And so you had a guy say the other day, people who would send their school where Karen Pence teach are not fit to be parents. And so in Ohio, you had a parents who would not consent to their daughter taking hormone therapy to become their son. And the court said she has a right to her own identity. Sorry, parents, you lose custody. We're giving it to the grandparents who are okay with it. That's what Obergefell did. You better pay attention. It's not just the result, it's how they got to it that matters. Thank you. You've been a great audience, all except for the lady in the back over here. And, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure y'all got 
uh, homework and other things to do, but if you want to just hang out at the malt shop for a while, I'm happy to answer any questions you didn't want to ask privately. But thank you. <laughs>